Acts of the Apostles. You all been acting up this summer? Yeah. Acting up like the apostles of Jesus? Acts chapter 16. Back to the story of Paul. Now, uh, if you have studied in between um, some of that, we, can't, we haven't gone through every, we could, it would take a long time. We have not gone through every single chapter of the book of Acts, but if you follow the story a little bit, you'll know that at first, when Paul um, became a disciple of Jesus Christ, he had been known by the Christian community as a persecutor, and so he did not have a really great reputation. And you know how it is when sometimes you just need somebody to stand beside you and to walk with you through something and to go, hey, he's all right. Hey, she's all right. Watch. Observe what God has done in this person's life. You might be surprised by how they have changed. And so there was a man named Barnabas who stood up for Paul. Um, when the Christians were going, ah, oh, we can't meet with him. We cannot invite him into our homes. He's a dangerous man. Um, but Barnabas stood up with him and said, hey, this guy's all right. Well, apparently, um, friends don't always agree. Did you know that? <laughs> um, apparently, Christians don't always agree. Um, but the one thing that we do agree on, what's the one thing that we agree on? Jesus Christ is Lord, and he calls us to love. That's two things. Jesus Christ is Lord and He calls us to love. Who does He call us to love? He calls us to love God and to love one another. So even though we don't always agree, and we learn in the scripture leading up to chapter 16 that Paul and Barnabas didn't always agree. And they, were, they had differences on who should go where and what they should do. And so they divided, they parted ways. And they both continued. Barnabas took with him Mark John. And Paul, who was kind of paired up with Silas already, also was introduced to Timothy. And so Timothy and Paul and Silas went on Paul's second missionary journey. And uh, this is where we pick up today. Verse uh, 6 of chapter 16. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the world and the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysa, they tried to enter Beth Bethnia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them. So they passed by Mesia, and they went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, Come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, he got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Brothers and sisters, the word of the Lord. Thanks to God. Let us pray. Holy God, we thank you and we bless you. We praise your name as we come to join our hearts together around your word and around your commandments and around your directives, God. Bless us, God, to embrace you and to open our hearts to, to how you want to speak with us today as we meditate upon this word. Thank you, precious God. Amen. So when I was in seminary, um, I went to Wesley Seminary because I wasn't sure what I wanted to be still when I grew up. And uh, part of it was I just refused to grow up for a really long time. I'm still working on that, um, as you know well, and I hope I'll always be working on that. Um, but I wasn't convinced that the local church was where I was supposed to do my ministry. But I had this weird collection of gifts. And one of the things that I really loved to do was make pottery. But I didn't want to just make pottery and go to craft sales. I didn't feel like that honored God. And so I began to um, create vessels that would be used in worship. And then I realized that maybe there was some way to merge this faith and art thing together. That's why I chose Wesley Seminary. Because they have a center for arts and religion. And, um, and you know, God changed my mind a lot of ways. And it's still changing my mind in a lot of ways. But one of the um, great things about being at that seminary was just meeting a huge diversity of people. Um, not just among the student body, um, but they had a center in the Center for Arts and Religion. They would have visiting artists come in for a semester or for a year. There was a monk who came in to work in art. And then there was this 
guy from Kentucky who was Baptist at the Baptist Seminary, and yeah, he was Baptist, well, um, his name was Tim Harris, and he was working on his PhD at Kentucky, um, I think Kentucky Methodist or Southern University or something like that, and uh, he had taken this one seminary um, semester out to come and work on his art because he too was learning how to tell the story through the visual arts. He did that by painting these pretty incredible paintings. One of my very favorites was a painting that he did which was based on a photo of his grandmother, who was in her 80s, holding his infant son. And when I saw it, I saw the photo and I saw the painting and I went, that is so beautiful, a picture of your grandmother and your son. He goes, that's not what that's about. He said, that piece is about Sarah. And you know, it really opened my eyes because we know that Sarah was up in, in years when she gave birth. And, um, and I thought, wow, what a beautiful picture because even though we knew she was an older woman, I always had a hard time wrapping my brain around her birthing a child at an old age. And um, so I was like, oh, wow, that's really cool. So I got a grasp a little bit of, of what he was doing. Occasionally he would ask a student, um, to sit for his paintings, and he came to me one day and asked me to sit for one of his paintings, and I went, oh, I don't think so. <laughs> two reasons. Number one, I don't sit still. Number two, who wants to look at a painting of me? I sure don't. And um, he kept after me and kept after me, and I finally said, okay, the only way I'll consent to this is if you just come down to my studio and let me work at the potter's wheel and you get what you want, but I, I still make no promises on the still thing. I don't do still very well. So he came down to my studio a couple times and he made some sketches and he took a couple of photos and then I didn't see anything for a little while. And one day I was walking by his studio and there it was. It was almost finished. It was this beautiful painting of me. And wow, I thought it was really cool actually. I, I was a little anxious about it. Um, and, and I walked over, and in the, in the picture, I was working on this pot that I was making for another class. That's a whole other sermon. And so, a picture of my hands, and if you look at the painting, it looks just this hand right here with my funky little curled up thumb. He, he captured that, and it, I'm working at, this, at the wheel on this pot, and I went in and I went, Tim, wow, I'm so flattered. This, this is great. You got my likeness. You even got the funky curly thumb, and he just grinned this big old southern boy ear to ear, ear grin, and he said, Michelle, it is not about you. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, sure it is. Look, there's the funky thumb, that's the piece, I was, that even looks like the pot I was working on. Okay, you changed the color of my apron, but that's cool, I like yours better, maybe I'll get a green one. Um, yeah, it's sure it's about me, and he said, no, this piece is about God, the Creator, who's in loving relationship with His own creation. And as I began to look at it, I realized that wasn't me at all. There was this figure that was hunched over even more than I normally would have been. And the, the look on her face at her own creation, the concentration and the, the, um, the love that was being expressed in that person's face, I went, wow. You're right. It's not about me. And you know that's sort of been my mantra for ministry for all these years. And it was such an important lesson for me to learn that it wasn't about me. And it wasn't about if I fit in this box of what preachers are supposed to look like, which we all know I don't. And it's a good thing preachers don't have to fit in a box, right? Um, it wasn't about if, if I could recite all the books of the Bible without skipping any. It wasn't about my understanding and depth of theology, it's simply about Jesus Christ. It's not about me. Um, Terry Scheip sent me an email a couple months ago and said, I'm warning you, I'm going to this conference and I might learn some stuff. <laughs> and I went, oh boy. And when he sent me the link of the conference that he was going to, and it was called the um, Global uh, Leadership Summit. Um, and it's put on by Bill Hybels. Any of you ever read any of Bill Hybels' work? Um, Too Busy Not to Pray um, is one. Simplicity is one of his newer books. And he is a church leader of a church that has 25,000 members in Chicago. And um, he is a leadership expert.
Stewart. And he does really great work, not just in his ministry, but it's part of his calling to train leaders, effective leaders, not just in church work, but in the corporate world um, to apply Christian principles. And so I was like, wow, that looks really good. And it turns out that there was a satellite location in Atlee. So I'm like, you mind if I copy you? I want to go. And so I got to go this past week, and, and it was really wonderful. And one day when I was leaving, the uh, to, just to show how God connects things from your past and, and how you will do leadership in the future, too. There I was at this conference, and I was going out to lunch, and there was this car in front of me leaving the parking lot. And the license plate was N-T-A-B-T-U-S. I couldn't figure it out at first. Not about us. And I went, okay, okay, I get it, Lord. And so this was such a, a wonderful conference. And, and I got to tell you, one of my favorite speakers was, um, his name is um, Horst Schulze. And he's a German man. But he is the president and CEO of the Ritz-Carlton Group all around the world. Um, quite an impressive man. And I want to get a copy of his video because um, it would be a great lesson for all of us. And he, he tells stories about when he was young, he wanted to work in a hotel. And um, he realized that working in a service-oriented occupation allowed him to be a gentleman serving ladies and gentlemen. And that became his motto, ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen. And he told such incredible, wonderful stories. But um, one of the things that he told was um, that he still, if I understood this correct, you correct me later, not right in the middle of my sermon though. Um, but he still, when new persons are hired at the different hotels for the Ritz-Carlton around the world, he still goes in with groups of new employees and does the orientation the first day himself. And he begins his, um, his lecture with them something like this. My name is Holtz Schulze, and he looks very diplomatic, you know, beautiful suit. The tie is tied perfectly, well manicured, holds himself with just great respect and dignity. And, and he's just, this, you know, you see him and you go, wow, he looks pretty important. And he starts out, just in case you missed by the way that he looks that he was important, he starts out his orientation session by saying, I am the president and CEO of the Ritz-Carlton group, and I am very important, and so are you. And he went on to say how the job of each and every person in, in the hotel industry is so important. He said, if you are a dishwasher and you don't show up for work, it is a disaster. If you are someone who makes beds and you don't show up to work, it is a disaster. And he started talking about what people want and, and how to meet customers' needs. But really what he was talking about was service. Was how we are called to serve one another. Not just in the Christian faith and in the church, um, but in the world. In the world. Wouldn't the world be a better place if we all served one another? He talked about... Um, going into a bank one day, and he said, I could tell when I walked into the bank that the lady um, didn't like me. You ever go to some place and you have somebody wait on you, they go, mm, they don't like their job. <laughs> They're having a really bad day. It might be the way that they are all the time, I don't know. But you, you look at them and you go, mm, she, she don't like me, he don't like me. And so instead of saying, you know, may I help the next customer, please, she went, next. And he went to her window and he said, all I want is change for 50, and she goes, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, next, didn't say thank you, or he said, how different would it have been if she said, may I serve the next customer, please, how may I help you, sir, yes, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, is there anything else I can help you with, I hope you have a nice day, now which would you want to be a part of, think about it, what was that, <laughs> I know who it was. I heard you guys know it. I just didn't hear what he said. Fill me in later. Which one would you want to be serving you? And then the next question is, which one do you think you should emulate? Christian or not Christian? But see, you're Christian, so you know which one you're supposed to emulate. What's the most important thing you learned in kindergarten, which is one of the most important things in life? 
Be nice. It gets much better rewards than being nasty. Even when you don't feel good. What does the scripture say? Rejoice in the Lord when you feel good. When you're having a great day. Always. Rejoice in the Lord always. Now, I want to talk to you. The reason that I brought this to you is that I want to talk to you about what we do as a church. And so this is perfect that BJ has brought these slides for us today because it captures some of our activities for the summer. I'm sure it doesn't, I haven't had a chance to look at all of them. I'm sure it doesn't capture all of our activities, but it captures a lot of our activities. What do you notice about most of those activities? Who are they about? Kids. Us. They're about us, aren't they? They're about us. They're about people like us. They're about people that come to us. And, and they were wonderful. We reached some families that aren't a part of our church, but they're an awful lot like us, and they came to us. What does it look like if instead of waiting for someone to come to the church, that the church comes to them? I was thinking and praying about that a few weeks ago. You know, I do some of my greatest praying in the shower and in the car. How about you? Think about it, you know? Um, people talk about prayer disciplines, and, you know, Bill Hodge will talk about too busy not to pray. Okay, I have it on my shelf. I haven't ever finished reading it, honestly, but I'm going to, especially now. I might need to get it on tape because then I can read it in the car, right? Um, but are you too busy? To pray? Are you too busy to find time to communicate with God? Then find time with God in the midst of the ordinary things that you do that don't require a lot of concentration. Like, do you have to concentrate on where the soap is in the shower or do you just automatically know where it is? Do you have to um, concentrate on where the towel is or do you have to, you know, think about this is where I hold my hands? You should maybe when you're driving the car, depends on how you drive. But are those times that you can multitask and really spend time in prayer? Too busy not to pray. We're all too busy not to pray. Um, preaching to the choir. Um, so I'm praying in the shower and on the way to church one day, and I was thinking, you know, what do we do this year for our September kickoff? Usually we do something kind of special. Maybe we have a luncheon together. Maybe we have some special celebrations in our worship. But... What can we do this year um, to kick off our, our New Year of Ministry? Because, you know, the New Year of Ministry starts in September, not in January. Because whether we have kids or not, whether we work in schools or not, we follow the, the school calendar pretty much, right? So we'll be gearing up for new studies, new classes, new opportunities um, in the fall. That's when we kind of kick all that off. What can we do that's different? And I thought, what if instead of it being about us, that we realize this time that it's not about us. So I want to tell you something that's going to happen on September 13th because I want every single person to be a part of it in some way. We already looked at the calendar. Maurice has to work that day. But we already figured out how he can be a part. Um, I know some of our um, folks are not physically able to go and do something with another person, but there are things that we can bring and things that we can supply. Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me tell you what we're going to do. So on September 13th, mark your calendar to be here. That's our kickoff Sunday. We're going to have worship and serve day. We're going to have one worship service that day on the front lawn. Maybe we'll put up that tent that's out there in the shed. I don't even know what it, what it looks like, but maybe we'll put that up out there. We're going to worship at 9 o'clock, all of us together. And then we're going to deploy we're going to split up into teams. Some of us are going to stay here. And we're going to put signs down the road. Free lunch. I don't know how we're going to do that yet. But whether it's a hot dog coming even under the tent or you drive through the loop and we hand you a hot dog and a bottle of water and a little brochure that says we're just here. We just want you to know we're here. Um, however we do that, that's yet to be ironed out. We're going to go um, and take um, study snacks to students on the campus of BSU. We're going to send a team over to... Um, the nursing home there in Dinwiddie. Is that on Cox Road? Whatever. Right on Gordon, Gordon Plank Road, right out there. Um, we're going to send a team over there to lead worship. We're going to send a team to take lunches um, to young men and young women who are recovering addicts. We're going to send um, a team to um, a low-income area with bad lunches to give out. What do you 
you think? Sounds crazy, doesn't it? But what would it look like if that day we as a community recognize it's not about us? So I presented that idea to the um, worship team. It wasn't that well developed then. And then we prayed over it and we, we came up with some neat ideas. And then, then we took it to the REACH team meeting um, last month and, and they put some great ideas on it. So tomorrow night at 6 o'clock, if you're interested in helping us out, we're going to have a meeting to further develop those ideas and get some teams going. So if you want to come and help with, with planning of it, Come tomorrow night at 6 if you can. If not, that's okay. We'll tap you later because I want, I would love to have 100%. Wouldn't it be awesome? Mary Thornhill can probably not go out and take lunch to somebody, but you got a way to get some loaves of bread, Mary? Yeah. Maurice Lindsay probably has to work that day. Can you bring some bologna or something? Whatever sandwich we decide we're going to take. Yeah, there are ways that everybody, you may not be able to be here, but you make that awesome coconut cake. Mm. You see what I'm saying? Everybody has a way that they can contribute that day. So mark your calendar right now. What would it look like if we really intentionally, even just for one day, we recognize it's not about us? You know what I tell you is going to happen? We're going to be blessed to be a blessing. And at first, we're not going to look forward to it so much. It's going to sound like a great deal of work. And it will be. But we're going to get there and we're going to have a blast. How many of you have gone over to Feed the Hungry um, here? And um, I, I, I went and took the youth. We had nine youth who fed the hungry on. I thought that song. That's not mine. That's yours. Okay. Um, we went over to Feed the Hungry um, the other day. We took nine youth over, um, and Tom and Ann led us, and, and they served the hungry. And they were a little nervous because some of them had never done it before. And they were like, what can I say? What do I do? And and, and Bryce said, um, is it okay if I say God bless you? And I went, yeah. <laughs> Heck yeah, it is. And he'd come back to the kitchen and he'd go, it was so cool. I said, God bless you. And they said it back to me. And it made him smile. It was so cool. They thanked me for bringing him lunch. We met this one guy who was so humble in one way and kind of boastful in another way. But it was delightful. I can't even remember what his name was. Um... But he, he told me a little bit about his story. You know, we make assumptions about people. You know what happens when you assume, don't you? You don't need me to spill out the part about donkeys. Okay, you got it. If you don't understand that, come ask me and I'll say it. Um, we make assumptions about people and why they are why they are. You know, and why are these people hungry? Are they homeless? Are they in a shelter somewhere? Are they just out of money? Is it that time of the month? Why are they hungry today? Oh, look at them. They're not well kept or... Maybe they are well cut. And how come they have a car and they can drive themselves, but they don't have enough food to eat? We make assumptions about people. That is not our job. But there was this one good-looking man, and he started telling us his story. And he goes, God taught me a lesson about pride. He said, I had a fancy car. I had a great apartment. Um, I worked for U-Crops, and it was my job to um, make sure that the food going out to Martin's, you know, the Ucrops foods going out. It was my job to make sure the temperature was correct on the truck. And he said one day my son was sick and I was really worried about him and I was distracted by that. And I didn't check the temperature and the food on that truck went bad. And I lost my job. And I lost everything. And now I'm in the shelter next door. Um, but I'm working. I'm, I'm working my way back up. You never know what the story is that you're going to meet. Who the person is that you're going to meet. But here's something that's really, really important to know. Every single person that you have ever met or that you will ever meet was made in the image of God. Every single one that you will ever meet. Yeah, there's a lot of things that make us different. With the children, I wanted to sing Jesus loves little children, red, yellow, black, and white. All of us, different, are precious in His sight. If we can recognize that every single person is made in the image of God and that they are important, then not only will our day go better in our interaction with them, but their day will go better in that interaction and their life will be touched. Not by what you said, not by what you gave them, but by how you treated them. Paul got the call to go to Macedonia. It's interesting because God closed a lot of doors for him. 
it, it, scripture tells us several places that are really difficult to pronounce, <laughs> that, that they wanted to go, and God closed doors, and then God gave Paul a vision, come to Macedonia. And the first person, you remember the first person who, who was saved because of his ministry in Macedonia was Lydia. You remember that? Uh, who would normally, she was a Gentile woman, who um, would normally not have even had the opportunity to be a part of the faith community. She was the first person saved because he went where God sent him. Who will be touched? Because you recognize it's not about you. It's about the God in whose image you are made, wanting to recognize the God in whose image the other person was made. How will you be changed by that kind of encounter? Let us pray. Holy God, we love you and we thank you for opportunities to be a part of your world and to be active in proclaiming who you are, not just with our words, but with all that we have and all that we are. So bless us, Lord, and, and this initiative, as we learn, God, what it means to, to recognize people who are different from us, but people who are also made in your image. As we recognize the importance of treating every single person like they're important, because they are. They are important to you, and therefore they are important to us. Bless us, God, and humble us. Humble us to recognize our place as a receiver of that kind of grace from you. Because had it not been for Jesus Christ, we would all be dead in our sin. But because of your grace, through the body and the blood of Jesus Christ, we have been saved. And that is something we ought to be shouting from the mountaintops, Lord. So give us grace. Give us courage. Give us just the ability to acknowledge that you, Creator God, are in every bit of your own creation. Thank you, God. We bless your name.